All right, everybody, welcome back to the office. Uh, pretty nice day. Uh, hopefully, uh, those three articles uh, give you some insight about what's going on. But there was a couple questions that I had that I just I couldn't wrap my head around. So what I did was I reached out to Alex Maschioli, a gentleman that actually uh, wrote or was in a part of those uh, different articles, just to ask him four specific questions. So Alex, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, so thanks. Uh, Rob, thank you for having me. It's an honor. I love the show. But so here's the first question. Uh, in the first article where we were talking about, it was the uh, big money moving into crypto markets. In the very, I don't know, first or second paragraph, you said a publicly traded company has converted a significant chunk of its balance sheet to Bitcoin. I was just curious about which company was that because there's all this different information out there. So you would be the guy that has the inside track. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story. So uh, the company is MicroStrategy Incorporated. Um, and they, uh, they're, they're a data analytics and uh, mobility company um, and uh, with a market cap of about 1.2, 1.3 billion. So they had a $500 million balance sheet. And they said that they took a, a couple of months, the CEO and I guess some of the uh, uh, executives, and they decided to purchase 250 million and put a Bitcoin and, and basically split their balance sheet in half. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're, it's interesting, the reasoning uh, to hedge against the valuation of fiat currencies. Um, right. So I, I, I found that particularly, particularly awesome because uh, it definitely is hitting all the uh, check boxes, at least for the maximalists. Yeah. And you know what? I remember covering that story um, maybe like four or five days ago. And what's interesting to me was that the CEO, it wasn't like he was beating around the bush and going, well, you know, Bitcoin could do this or it might do something like this. He was like, this is what it's going to be. And we put 250 million into this because we believe strongly that this thing's going to happen with the economy, with all the money printing and, to, you know, hedge against uh, all the different things that are happening. So I found that the most interesting uh, on top of what they'd already done. So. I thought it was a pretty good step. They had analyzed a lot of a lot of different investments um, and that weren't crypto related uh, before making that step and, and purchasing essentially twenty one thousand four hundred Bitcoin. But it was uh, it was the best option they had. They said, "Yeah." And then I mean, they have all that all that data, all those analytics to look at everything out there that you know I don't have. I mean, and and with as many resources, maybe not you don't have, and of course the average guy doesn't have. So. If looking at all these things and going, you know what, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, digital assets, I think that's a that's a bullish sentiment. That's just my thing. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Right? <laughs> so, all right. So 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 that was that. Okay, I just want to make sure. So yeah, I got it. Um, the second one was since you're in the space, uh, you're in the ses you're in the space with these high net investors. Um, what's the sentiment with them? You know, two, three, four years ago. And what's their thoughts on digital assets now? I mean, do you kind of get that, that feeling like we're, we're, we're crossing the Rubicon, we're actually getting over the, this hump and they want to come in? Or is it kind of like, eh, you know what, we'll wait and see? Yeah, I mean, we've been speaking with institutional investors, um, which carried over from the traditional hedge fund side of the street uh, for, for the last three years. And um, there has been a big shift in the wind, so to speak, on that. Uh, there's a lot, there was a lot, a lot of skepticism three years ago, two years ago, uh, around, um, institutional investors, uh, allocating a portion of their portfolio into cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin in particular. Right. Um, I think what has happened over those, that time frame is that crypto has not gone away. And we're seeing month over month, different stories popping out of mainstream businesses or financial services houses uh, getting into it in some way or another. And so I think maybe a few of them decided that they wanted to uh, watch it, just watch it go away, but it didn't. So right now what we're looking at from an investment or a portfolio allocation uh, uh, style of thinking from them is that they're either directly investing into Bitcoin or they're laying uh, the responsibility onto a, uh, a hedge fund or asset manager. And, you know, 
whether it comes to Bitcoin or another crypto, um, they're slowly beginning to understand. And I think the figures around one to 5% of portfolio allocation into crypto is kind of where the winds are. But we're also seeing the check writers, uh, those amounts uh, of allocation of capital into outside asset managers, um, you know, go up slightly. I would say maybe 30% over last year and, and last year, was 90% over the year before, as far as the amount of checks they were uh, writing or the, you know, the amount of capital they were investing. Yeah, that's insane. But you know what? It makes total sense. One to 5%, you're not, you know, you're not breaking the bank and then they can get in there and get exposure. Then I don't have too much high of a risk. I always thought this would be a great idea for all the different um, uh, finance managers to tell their clients go, Hey, uh, Hey Bob, just so you know, you know, we have these new things, this new digital asset or asset class. And we, we go one to 3%, not going to crush you. And it's one of the best performing assets over the last decade, Bitcoin and Ethereum. What do you say? I just, I, I just don't see why uh, they, they won't do that moving forward. So it makes total sense about that. Yeah. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a long sales cycle for them, right? You know, I mean, I've advised and educated corporate pension funds and, and a sovereign wealth fund over the last uh, uh, 36 months. And I will tell you that that process is a very long one when interacting with their operational due diligence teams that select uh, investments. Um, so I still don't see them coming in uh, in the near term. I would say we're probably looking for uh, liquid trading strategies to be invested in by corporate pensions going out 12, 18 months. Gosh, can you imagine pensions coming in? Pensions? <laughs> We may not have enough Bitcoin left. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And see, this is, this is why having you on is so invaluable. Because like we, our, this channel covers those stories, but to get you know, the story behind the story and listen to somebody who's actually you know, in that space, walking and talking to these people, it just kind of validates all those things. Because a lot of people, they'll say, well, it's just a story, you know, and, and anybody can make these things up. But I mean, here's Alex, and he's talking about like, look, I talk to these people. I know these people. This is, this is where the winds are going. So. Uh, I got to tell you, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. But, um, no but that, and then, so all these people that are coming in, which is fantastic, right? But the question is then when you talk to these people, what's their digital asset of choice? Are they, is it just Bitcoin? Are they like, you know what? I hear Bitcoin or is it like Ethereum or is it something like some crazy stuff? Like, Hey, I heard about this tomato coin. I got to get into this. What is it? I like to, you know, I'd like to say everybody's still taking baby steps in this. So when we're talking to um, an institutional investor from a principal standpoint, as in it's their capital, uh, it's 100% Bitcoin that they discuss. But that being said, they are, uh, the allocators are willing to uh, put money with successful asset managers in the space that are that are trading across an array of coins so it, it could be ethereum it could be ripple it could be it could even be DeFi. i know there's a lot of asset managers that have certain allocation DeFi now um so when they make that investment into these asset managers they're leaving it up to that manager to drive alpha for them and and get those uh those yields um and they're not particularly concerned with uh what particular coin because that's what they're hiring the asset manager to do but when it comes to normal conversations mm -hmm. it's bitcoin that's what everybody knows and hears first um and so uh you know that's that's their educational uh standpoint right now yeah, and I get it. I mean, people out there, when, when I do a video, and I talk about Bitcoin. It's one of my main holdings. They're like, why are you into Bitcoin? That is an old technology. It is the Netscape Navigator. Uh, why don't you upgrade to Google Chrome or Brave Browser? And I tell them, like, look, you have to understand, uh, this has been around for over a decade. It's been battle tested. People know it, and it's in the public consciousness. So when I start talking about the different things that are going to pop off, I think it's going to be Bitcoin first, because I just think that's how it's going to go then Ethereum, and then down the line, all the way to, uh, you know, a coin market cap of 150. But that's just how I see it. And now it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Something like that. And then I think it's a volatility. I think it's a volatility discussion, right? You know, I mean, Bitcoin, it, you go back to your question uh, one with micro strategies, uh, converting some of their balance sheet. Um, and it, it's an hedge against devaluation of fiat. So I think that, you know, Listen, Bitcoin is one type of investment strategy. 
I think it is going to, it begins to differentiate from say the DeFi's, which are, you know, are, are accumulating very quickly or the mid cap uh, coins that are lower down on the coin market cap sector, which are a lot more volatile. Right. So I think they're all different uh, investment strategies in their own right. Yeah. I try to be as safe as I can or as safe as I can be in crypto. And that's one of the safe bets, but you know, people want to invest in, in the lower ones and even I do as well, but it's not that much. So if you if you got 5%, 3%, whatever else, and you're, you're putting X percentage into Bitcoin and then 10% into something, 10% into something else. Sure. It makes sense. All right. Thanks, Alex. Cleared that up. The last question I have for you, and this was from, this was the, the article where it talks about the quant now in crowded prime bro brokerage race. And this is what your CEO was talking about. And this was, I thought, the crux of the arguments or the, the conversation. He stated uh, one of the issues that we've had with some of our exchanges is the rate per second allocation. Uh, if you trade a high frequency trading strategy, you may want to opt into a higher rate per second allocation. The quant's internal trading average is around 400 microseconds per trade which is close to the London Stock Exchange, 150 microseconds. And when I, when I read this, I went back to an article that I had uh, you know, heard about a long time ago with that, the Transatlantic Cable, which was by uh, Hibernian Atlantic, but they built it from New York to London, just, and it was billions of dollars, I'm sure, to, to run a cable all the way that way. And the only thing it did was it uh, sped up their transactions by five milliseconds so they could get an advantage. So, when I see these types of things, I see these big guys coming in and they have, you know, these high transaction volumes uh, and they're, they're reducing the actual rates. How does that work for the little guy? Like, I don't know, yeah. me. I mean, I, I think so. I don't think it would have, it really affects the, the everyday person investing in Bitcoin. Uh, or cryptocurrencies, um, you know, the latency issues, which is uh, the speed of uh, transactions um, is really geared towards high frequency uh, shops. Um, so they're doing thousands of uh, transactions, transactions per minute, uh, maybe even per second. So latency is very critical to them in order to uh, really make that arbitrage yield that's happening. And it's a very little yield. That's why they trade a lot of volume very, very quickly so that those pennies add up to dollars. Um, you know, but the way it works is the closer you sit as a trader to the venue that you're trading off of is the quicker that your trades will get executed. So for instance, if you were uh, an equity shop and you were trading, uh, you know, uh, primarily across the New York Stock Exchange. You want to be sitting as close to their servers as possible and connecting to them, as opposed to a guy sitting in uh, Ohio. Uh, so there's a difference in speed. So with us, there's we have a very low latency um, institutional trading platform, and we actually have uh, hedge fund clients from all over the world that ship us servers, and these servers sit next to ours or cross connect and that way that when they're trading it's happening right there instantly between servers sitting next to each other and not a guy in California who's trading to a matching engine in London. That's amazing. That's crazy. And these things just, just happen like split seconds, milliseconds, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's, it's done. Microseconds. <laughs> See, this is, this is the world that I am not a part of. That's why I'm glad you're here to explain it because it just blows my mind that things happen that fast and those transactions are you know, running around and it's just like milliseconds. That's amazing. Those transactions are being run by, by machines as well. So, I mean, you know, you say, hey, how can a trader fire off a thousand trades in a minute? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, not being, it's not being executed by a human. Um, it's being executed by an algo-driven computer. Yeah, perfect, which goes off to our first article, which talked about Capital One and the artificial intelligence they're building and the patent and everything else. Full circle, Alex, great job. You're making my job easy, I appreciate it. No worries. Thank you, Rob. Pleasure right. to be here. And then everybody, just so you know, Alex Maschioli has got his own YouTube channel. It's in one of my top five or top six under the recommendation, which you can find in the description of every one of my videos. And the reason I like to watch it is because he has some of the best people in the game and he gives us access to a world that uh, we may not be actually privy to because he's got the people that make up these things. Alex, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. All right.
All right, hope you liked that little segment. Hopefully it's uh, shed some light. I gotta tell you, these are a world I'm not uh, aware of, so I'm glad Alex had the time. If you like these types of videos, I mean, two more that's gonna pop up on your left and right. Not for sure, because uh, YouTube controls that. Just like the uh, unbelievable ad you probably saw, which was probably a scam, and uh, I'm not, I have no control over that. So if you have any problems, talk to YouTube. They'd love to hear from you. And that's it. So thanks a lot. Appreciate you guys stopping by. See you on the next one.